again, astronauts. Eris managed to find another video to react to, so I'm here to watch episode three of the historical fiction series, Ancient Apocalypse. Welcome to Bad Astra. What? Netflix put it under documentaries? That must be a mistake, right? Right? Well, hello, Astra and Eris and any astronauts that happen to be tuning in. And of course, hello to you, dear viewer. Welcome back. Uh, that was Astra, in case you didn't catch that. She's a scientist, uh, part of a team of scientists known as Bad Astra. It's Astra, Eris, Nova, and Apollo, according to their Instagram. Um, they're women of STEM, like my daughter, the neuroscientist. I, I do have a soft spot for that. And um, they actually do a lot of astronomy, so they're right up my alley. So. For those of you who've watched me do response videos to response videos to Graham Hancock in the past, this is going to be a lot different because their angle is not nearly as much into archaeology as it is on the astronomy side. So we'll get a little bit of a deeper dive into astronomy. We won't get kind of the ineptitude we've seen at times from the archaeologists when they're like, you can't aim a building at a star. We won't, we won't be seeing any of that kind of shenanigans here. Um, and uh, there's a twist, too, because, well, you know, there's something that's going to come up that's pertinent that I don't really want to discuss, but it's some debunking deep lore. So, uh, yeah, you should probably just stick around for that part, if nothing else. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Debunking. Let's have fun. to take a look at the high budget equivalent of a white guy repeating what he heard on Joe Rogan's podcast for eight episodes. Front of the line for decades and and you exposed me to a lot of these controversial ideas that have now been substantiated. Well, I'm... Oh no, that's the host of this show. That was supposed to be just a dumb joke. Yeah, that's where Joe got most of his ideas from. As a matter of fact, you could say that Graham Hancock is the modern face of Atlantis hunting. Not like the original modern start of Atlantis hunting. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But he is the modern face of it. He's definitely the most pertinent, most popular figure doing it today. And Joe Rogan's gotten a lot of his ideas from him. For those of you who don't know, Ancient Apocalypse is a documentary hosted by Graham Hancock that was recently released on Netflix. Its central premise is that there was a lost civilization, <coughs> Atlantis, <coughs> that was far more advanced than the simple hunter-gatherer societies, but they were lost to a great flood. But the episode we're focusing in on involves investigating temples and caves in Malta for evidence of human presence during the Ice Age, much earlier than archeologists currently believe humans were in Malta, which will eventually tie into his Atlantis conspiracy theory. Now it's a safe assumption they chose episode three because it's focused on archeoastronomy, which is in line with their expertise, which is great. That's why I'm making a response to it, but this will be my first time technically punching down and um, so I got to get a couple things out of the way. Like when I did a response to history for Kaylee, I had to say this in the very beginning of the video. Please keep your criticisms of Kaylee like you would anybody else that I respond to. Talk about her ideas. Talk about her personality if you honestly feel that it's worth addressing. But keep it there. Don't do any of the innies or any of the isms or any of the stuff that's going to make me have to start slapping you around. If I so much as smell two fedoras in my comment section, I will start shutting shit down faster than you can roll your eyes. So please, I'm sorry to even have to say this, but let, let's just, let's just, I don't want any repeats of what I've seen on Twitter. Uh, not on my end of the internets anyway. So, and that goes for this video even more because I don't want to be responsible for a bunch of people going over there to talk trash to them. I do want you to go over to their channel and subscribe to it, especially if you love astronomy. If you love archaeoastronomy, one of their videos alone should sell you on it. They have E.C. Croup on there, the guy who wrote this little book right here. Today, I'll ask him for his sun, moon, and rising signs. Hi, Dr. Krupp. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. Just a delight, and I'm going to check my copy of Ptolemy's Almagest to make sure I get those signs correct. I mean, he's probably the foremost expert in archaeoastronomy in the world right now that, like, speaks English as his first language, so he's a lot more easy for me to understand than guys like Giulio Magli, for example. So, yeah, you should go check them out. But, but, 
let me be very clear here. I'm not going to tolerate any comments about appearances or anything. No sexism, period, end of story. None of that shit at all. I, none of it, okay? I don't care if you're a Patreon supporter. I will not tolerate that. It, it, it's a sad reality of the internet that if a woman puts her face on there, there's a really good chance that she's going to have all kinds of people saying all kinds of shit about her looks. And, you know... Astra have worked hard for her credentials, and I'm not going to be like having that shit all over on my channel. So I don't give a fuck who you are. I will boot you so hard into next week you will be GOH and gone. Big archaeology is hiding the truth of Atlantis. <laughs> that is great. <sighs> that is pretty good. Big archaeology, like big oil or big pharma. That's pretty funny. Um, I'd say I have heard it before. But, but, you know, it is still, ch it is still chuckle worthy, but I, I do have to say that there are organizations like the Society for American Archaeology that would technically qualify as big archaeology. And, you know, as crazy as it is, there is information they hide about this stuff. Not, not, not that like they know where Atlantis is or they have evidence of it or anything like that, but there is evidence, there is data that they hide in order to forge a narrative as we will discuss further down this video and you can take that to the bank one of the problems i have with the mainstream view mainstream view of the development of civilization is the notion that our own civilization in the 21st century is the apex and the pinnacle of human achievement this makes us very conceited it makes us very big-headed we look back on the past as though our ancestors were always simpler than us, had less knowledge than us, had less ability than us. Okay, so I couldn't get past the introduction without finding something to complain about, so this is going to be a wild ride. Here's the thing. We don't view humans that came before us as stupider or simpler. We view them as having less knowledge because the greatest technology that humans have, the thing that separates us from other species, is our ability to pass along information. This is just a more modern way of wording things. Intelligence is really just defined as the ability to gain new knowledge or skills. And, uh, you know, as an astrophysicist, I'm sure that Astro is aware that if you don't have some knowledge, you can't, you don't have access to other knowledge. Like with mathematics is a perfect example of that, for example. So, <sighs> example, example. So my point here is, well, I do get to complain, let me say that, I, I get that it's loaded terminology and that like if it's used in the modern day especially to describe indigenous people, it can get pretty effing ugly pretty fast. So this is the kind of terminology we need to look out for. But when you're talking about ancient peoples, I don't see the ancient Greeks getting pissed off about it, for example. And furthermore, Hancock's an old dude. He's going to be using the terminology from the old times. I mean, like... If you were to, and, and his terms are generally accurate, like if you were to take and put this in astronomical terms, like the heliocentric model is more advanced than the geocentric model, right? But that doesn't mean that the people in geocentric times were stupid, they just didn't have access to the same information. And then when they go from the heliocentric model to the Big Bang type of theory that we have now, uh, it doesn't really mean that just the early days of heliocentrism were stupid either. They just had limited access to knowledge, and that limited what they were able to learn, making it more primitive, more simple, less advanced. That's not to be in offensive, but again, I do understand how those terms can absolutely be employed to do some ugly shit. The introduction to this episode is designed to prime the viewer to distrust archaeological consensus and make Graham seem like an underdog whose evidence is being repressed. Graham is not an archaeologist or a scientist. He's a journalist with a sociology degree. I would recommend you be wary of any science documentary which aggressively paints scientists as antagonists. No, I agree the antagonism towards archaeologists is not a good look. And I also agree that if you're going to watch a documentary where the guy's like, hey, mainstream archaeology is bad, you probably need to fact check that shit just a little bit, right? I mean, Hancock could absolutely try to forge a narrative with archaeologists, and even though they disagree, he can still like talk with them and stuff. I've had no problem, for the most part, doing that with several archaeologists on the Twitters. 
the only there is a couple of places that we had sticking points one in particular and we'll get to that in a little bit foreshadowing already we're in shady territory when he's discussing gigantia a megalithic temple in malta from the neolithic era well graham puts that timeline into question because there are no reliable carbon dates or writing to pinpoint when the temple was constructed does he have evidence to back up that claim no is a lot of archaeology based on extrapolating from a small amount of data and hoping for the best? Absolutely. However, the artifacts found in the temple date to the Neolithic era, so it's a pretty safe assumption that the temple was built and that the artifacts were in the temple very soon after. The Neolithic era. Graham says that he thinks the artifacts were a lot younger than the temple and were placed there many centuries later, which... There's no evidence to prove that this is more likely, and it goes in flagrant violation of Occam's razor. Now, they've excavated under the stones of the temples of Malta, and so the dating there is pretty secure, and they don't really have to rely on context dating. They've got carbon that's right under the stone, and so it's like... That rock went down, the grass that's under that rock, it is a, probably a safe bet that nobody's gone under that rock and dug it up since then, unless there was archaeologists 4,500 years ago, because that's about when they date to you, right, right in that area. When mainstream science says, imagine that. But Hancock, you know, he's going to go at this from a different angle. He's going to look at it with archaeoastronomy. He's going to try to date it that way. And generally speaking, archaeoastronomy is not a very good way to date things. Now, there are cases hypothetically that it will work very good for example the hoover dam has a star chart there and if you know your astronomy well enough you're going to be able to peg your date on that one really 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 good not wedding date accurate but you get wedding year accurate and that's not the kind of archaeoastronomy that hancock's going to be employing but hypothetically it is feasible and i think that is important to point out because you will hear people frequently say there's no way you can date things well okay you technically could you don't really see it happen but technically it could that's important to mention in my opinion but how did these giants get to malta to build gigantia by walking from sicily during the ice age this theory of earlier humans walking to Malta over a land bridge when sea levels were over 100 meters lower is technically plausible, since we know humans were in Sicily at the time. But why does Graham think this is more likely than humans arriving thousands of years later by boat over water, which we know they had the technology to do at the time? Because a few Neanderthal teeth were found in a cave in a layer associated with the Paleolithic rather than Neolithic period. Maybe. Whether the teeth were from a Neanderthal or just a modern human with pteridont molars, and whether they were from the older Paleolithic or more recent Neolithic layer is actually the subject of confusion, since different dating tests have yielded different results and cataloging errors were much more common in 1917 when the teeth were discovered. It's not that the results were covered up, as Graham asserts. In fact, these teeth have been discussed and tested by archaeologists for a century, but they weren't seen as conclusive evidence. And since there is no other evidence for early humans on Malta before 3600 BC, the archaeological consensus is that humans most likely arrived on Malta via boat around that time. Sure, further study is definitely needed, but portraying these teeth as a smoking gun and archaeologists as covering up the paradigm-shifting evidence is misleading. Now, this teeth have been a subject of so much controversy from cultural pride, as far as I can tell, and from tourism. Um, the people that live there in Malta now believe that their ancestors are the ones that built these temples. But archaeology is pretty clear that they're descended from a different group of people, that the original inhabitants of Malta, the ones that built these temples, died off or left, and that a second group of people moved in, and these are the native Maltese today. That's not something that you will find in their tourism. That's not something you will really find in, uh, in their locals enjoying to talk about such things very often. Um, I've talked about this a little bit. It'll be a picture of a video somewhere around here. Um, but anyway, my point is, is that that's where the, the teeth issue comes up, is that it kind of pushes the peopling back even further than it should. And it, 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 
they they like to have it in a specific timeline as best as I can tell. Again, I can't I can't say this for certain, but this is as best as I can tell because there is no question that it took a private individual paying money to have these teeth carbon dated. I mean that's that's not a good look. You might not say this is big archaeology, and I agree it's not big archaeology. In my opinion, it's like tourism and nationalism and cultural pride and all that shit, but it's still like evidence being for whatever reason. However, the man-made cart tracks, which crisscross all over Malta, are present in other areas around the Mediterranean and often extend underwater, implying that humans were there when sea levels were a lot lower, is compelling evidence. I would actually like to see further study into these underwater cart tracks to see how deep they go and potentially infer when they were carved based on the sea level at the time. Based on other sources I looked at, these tracks were likely used to help carts transport stones from quarries to the temples. So this is probably the most compelling evidence of earlier humans in Malta than anything else in this episode. This is the kind of take that makes me respect a person or a group of people a whole lot. And they don't have to say, oh, you know, well, Hancock may have had a point here. They could just pretend that he didn't and just hammer at it one-sidedly like other potholers out there would do but that's not what we're getting from them at all we're getting this intellectual honesty so honestly honesty you need to go click the button on their channel let me reiterate that again Th this kind of intellectual honesty shouldn't go unrewarded seriously so go click the button on their channel subscribe to them encourage them to make more videos even if they're not exactly your favorite thing as far as they're debunking some of this stuff if you're watching me i'm certain that you've seen me say something that i don't that you don't like and you're still watching me anyway right they got some really good shit you should go click on their stuff and they're intellectually honest and the cart ruts the cart ruts are cool man i mean aren't they cool but there's not much known about them. It well, very well could be evidence of people being on there a long time before we did know that there were people there. Man, I'm good with those English words today. But anyway, the, the cart ruts are one of the, the, the funnest things about Malta, in my opinion. And uh, they're so enigmatic. And um, so, yeah, props to them for acknowledging that and yay cart ruts. Moving on, we learn about a fascinating and little known movement in the sky called procession. Okay, this is actually a fun fact. We'll give Graham the benefit of the doubt and say that yes, most people may not know that the Earth is not a perfect sphere and the axis causes a slight wobble that shifts our skies every 26,000 years. And yes, the position of the star would move by one degree approximately every 72 years. These descriptions are, in fact, correct. Now, this is a place where Hancock has ed actually educated the public. I mean, he's not the first guy to intertwine procession of the equinoxes with Atlantis hunting, but he's definitely pushed it hard and made it more popular in the modern day. And there's a lot of people like myself. I mean, I was an amateur astronomer when I was a Boy Scout back in the 80s. <sighs> Holy crap. Um, and uh, way back then, even, um, I didn't know what procession was, but in the 90s when I read Fingerprints of the Gods, well, then I learned what, fing what uh, procession was. And I'm not alone there. Like, I love astronomy, right? Um, but uh, procession is something that's a little bit more esoteric. You don't really, that doesn't come up if you're a stargazer, right? And it's the kind of thing that you will find, there's a ton of people in the Atlantis hunting community that they couldn't find the North Star to save their ass. But they could absolutely tell you about procession of the equinoxes and correct you. It's not 72 years, it's 71.6. And they will tell you they got that from fingerprints of the gods. However, they use these facts to set up their theory that these temples were built long before the time span of 3600 to 2600 BC, which is the dating that archaeologists have given these temples according to their peer-reviewed research. The links to those studies are down below, since we couldn't find any studies to support any of Graham's claims. Spoiler alert. Now, if you dig into this sort of thing, you'll find that people in the Atlantis hunting community frequently date things based on archaeoastronomy, and it's almost always much older than mainstream archaeology gives it credit for, which is why I'm trying to drag these scientists from Bad Astra into the community a little bit harder because... Uh, they could weigh in on some of this stuff and have um, some new data that 
Well, currently we're stuck with dumbasses like me coming in and saying stuff. And I, and I can find the North Star, but I don't have any of the fancy degrees that they do. And there's four of them. However, using state-of-the-art software to rewind the clock. Wait, zoom in. He's literally just using Worldwide Telescope in the documentary. It's free software anyone can access, which is awesome. But I'd hardly call it like state of the art. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. I didn't know that wasn't state of the art software and I'm one of the more astronomical savvy pyramidiots on the YouTubes, right? We could, we could use you scientists in, 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 to make more vids. Graham and his friend, who is also not an astronomer or an archaeologist, discovered that apparently the temples, which face slightly different directions, all line up with one star, if you account for that star's precession, or where it would have been in the sky at different times as the sky shifted about one degree every 72 years. But this would place the temple's construction much earlier than big archaeology thinks. Well, they could have all aligned with Sirius, the brightest star in the sky and subject of our Sirius love song serenade, at time of construction. Assuming the temples were built dating back 11,000 years ago, which would have been before early humans were thought to have first arrived in Malta. What an incredible discovery, and how neat that two hobbyists put that together using free, publicly available software. If Sirius was the only star that fit this series of growing temples. When looking at an archaeological timeline from 3600 to 2600 BC, Robert Peter Barrett, an archaeologist whose entire PhD focus is on these temples, wrote an article called The Crux of Astronomical Alignment in Neolithic Malta, using 3D simulation to produce new data, in which he found that the constellation Crux, the cross, fits the alignment of these temples, assuming they were constructed between 3600 and 2600 BC. In Mr. Barrett's paper, he cites a paper that I bring up pretty much every time I discuss the Sirius correlation on Malta. In 1992, Michael Hoskins, Giorgio Serio, and Frank Ventura published The Orientations of the Temples of Malta, which summarized its findings as Crux being the most likely candidate. I mention this because I don't believe that Rejic actually like did this work with that state-of-the-art crap. I think that she did something on the state-of-the-art crap, but she got her declamation and azimuth readings from the work of these other guys, like Michael Hoskin, who was like critical in legitimizing the field of archaeoastronomy. He was like a key player in that. And so she takes his work and does this with it. So <laughs> <laughs> While we're on the subject of misleading astronomy, let's talk about the related conspiracy theory that Graham has his hands all over, Orion Correlation Theory. It's a major crux of Graham's work over the years and is widely regarded as bullshit by astronomers. The theory is that the pyramids are aligned with the stars in Orion's belt. However, they don't align as perfectly as Graham and his colleagues claim. They estimate 47 to 50 degrees per the planetarium measurements compared to the 38 degree angle formed by the pyramids. Well, not completely. Check out the paper linked below by physics professor Vincenzo Orofino titled A Quantitative and Astronomical Analysis of the Orion Correlation Theory published in 2011. In it, he not only demonstrates that there's a layout correlation, but he also demonstrates an inverse magnitude uh, correlation where the magnitude of the stars is inversely correlated with the size of the pyramids. And he finds the, uh, the big kicker here, he finds a fourth dynasty date. He doesn't find some 12,000 year old date. So there are some, some archaeoastronomers out there that remember that you know archaeology is part of archaeoastronomy and so they don't just throw away all the rest of the stuff and just go dating things whenever the hell they want. And they still find the Orion correlation theory um, compelling. As a matter of fact, somebody else fired back at him with some other stuff. There's a, there's a couple of papers back and forth. I'll, I'll link one below, but you can find more. You've, you've got access to all this fancy stuff. All I gotta do is give you his name and you can go hog wild with it. They go further to claim that the Sphinx is Leo and on the map of the heavens that is the pyramids and the Sphinx, the Milky Way lines up with the Nile. It all connects. Except 
for how Krupp and Farrell found other problems with their arguments, including noting that if the Sphinx is meant to represent the constellation of Leo, then it should be on the opposite side of the Nile, the Milky Way, from the pyramids, Orion. That the vernal equinox, circa 10,500 BC, was in Virgo and not Leo, and that in any case, the constellations of the zodiac originate from Mesopotamia and were completely unknown in Egypt until the much later Greco-Roman era. <sighs> okay, here we go. Uh, the Sphinx and the pyramids are both basically 180 degrees from where they should be. And the uh, pyramids are inversely correlated to the magnitude of the stars. So it seems like this backwardsness is, kind of shows up a lot. And if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphs, you will see this sort of thing show up frequently. And for those of you who know much about like the Hermeticism and stuff, or the sacred geometry, and I'm not saying I believe in that stuff, but the belief of that stuff is as above, so below. So mirroring the sky on the ground makes sense. And in case you aren't aware, which I'm sure you are, a mirror flips shit backwards. So having things on the ground opposite isn't entirely insane. Um, it's if they would be all scattered willy-nilly that, that it would be crazy in my opinion. Now Orion was a key constellation in the rebirth and funerary stuff of the ancient Egyptians. It was like a part of their religious stuff. It was equated with Osiris. So having it show up in their funerary complexes uh, that's not really crazy at all. That that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, when when you start talking about like the Sphinx itself being a lion, now it, w when Krupp is debunking that, he's talking about it. You know, ten thousand five hundred BC. Okay, I can get that. Uh, that's that. You're stretching stuff there. Now it's on the cusp back then as to whether it's Leo or or uh, Virgo. So you you can argue that one back and forth like you could argue right now if we're in the age of Aquarius or not or in the age of Pisces still. You could argue that until you're blue in the face, right? Whatever. Now as for knowledge of the constellations, yeah, if you go back twelve thousand years, we don't really know for sure if they knew anything about the Sphinx or not. Um, but we do know that like. The ancient Egyptians believed in a thing called Zeptepi, which was the first time it was like the time of their gods and stuff, and it was heavily associated again with rebirth. So seeing the Sphinx, it's quite possible the Sphinx was made to emulate the Zeptepi the first time, that it was like they figured out procession, calculated it or miscalculated it, and said that this was where this equinoctial marker was. Because with the thing facing due east and carved like a zodiacal symbol, it's really hard to get around it being an equinoctial marker meant to represent Leo. You really have to like, you really have to stretch it to look otherwise. But if you do go back to 12,000 years ago, yeah, I'm with you. I don't think there were people carving, carving Leos on the ground 12,000 years ago. I would have to agree with you there. Side note, amateur astronomers are incredible and have made fantastic discoveries and contributions to both astronomy and astrophotography. This video is not to sass backyard astronomers who create beautiful images and spread the joy of this field beyond academia. However, I'm surprised that in a Netflix budget documentary with a section focused on astronomy, no actual astronomers were interviewed. Well, thanks. You know, I haven't made any contributions, but I do love me some backyard astronomy. <laughs> um, no, I live in town, so it's actually get in the car, drive out of town, up into the mountains, into the hills, into a valley, and look up at the sky astronomy with no light pollution. But I do love me some amateur astronomy. And I have to say the reason Netflix didn't include an astronomer is because they had cutting edge software, right? <laughs> no, honestly, what they really needed here was somebody to like roll them back into carbon dating land and just be like, okay guys, we got some dating on these temples that's, 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 that's based in the earth. So they could have used um, an archeologist there. Again, it, it's archeo astronomy. So you kind of, you, you need both. But why does Graham's ancient civilization theory matter? Am I just mad because he's misusing astronomy? Maybe further research is needed to see whether the man-made channels or the teeth are really evidence of early humans on Malta. Sure, he's not an archaeologist and is spouting out some debunked stuff about Orion, but does that fully discredit what he says about the Malta temples and Sirius? And even if so, why should we care? about whether someone thinks ancient people walked to Malta a few thousand years earlier when sea levels were lower. Whatever. Now this is a valid question both ways. Does Atlantis hunting actually cause any 
harm to society or, or not? Does it foster a lack of trust in science in general, or is it a symptom of that sort of thinking in the modern day? You know, we see more science denial in my life today than we ever have before. Even back in the 90s with like the hippie resurgence, we we had some vaccine deniers, but not like we do now. And flat earthers, shit, you never met those guys. Electric universe? <laughs> no, we didn't hear none of this craziness. But, but for some reason, nowadays we see tons of this stuff. So the question she posits is one that is worth entertaining in my opinion. Now, the juicy part. Atlantis is real and big archaeology wants to cover it up. I'm gonna try to do this with a straight face. Atlantis is real and big archaeology wants to cover it up. I tried. I tried with the delivery, Eris. No, I laugh at this all the time myself. The notion that scientists are and have been actively hiding data for a century is, is absurd. But it's held by a lot of people and as such it is worth addressing. Uh, there are certain aspects of this stuff, particularly in regards to ancient Egypt, that create doubt. For example, the construction timeline of 20 to 30 years for the Giza pyramids is not seen in written records, nor is it supported by the archaeological data. It's a holdover to the times before carbon dating, back when the Egyptian timeline was a gold standard and the pyramid construction was shoehorned into it. The carbon dating for the 4th dynasty structures is almost always 150 to 300 years older than the mainstream archaeological timeline claims it is. Almost always. But they won't budge on the timeline that's written on a piece of stone somewhere. Carbon dating doesn't matter compared to that, which is a little bit weird. I can tell you from personal experience that many archaeologists will react to claims of the pyramids taking 60 years to build the same as they would react to claims of them being 12,000 years old. They're just like, no, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. we know. And it's kind of funny because they never say that when they're talking to other scientists. It's always, you know, we believe, we think, the evidence points to, but... When they talk to a pseudoscientist, boy, do they know all of a sudden. <laughs> Always funny. But this hegemony can easily be viewed as hiding of evidence or denial of it. Now, I frequently refer to the pyramid construction timeline as a gateway drug to being a pyramid idiot, and this is why. If someone accepts that archaeologists are not willing to tell the truth about the pyramids, then the giant bones in the Smithsonian look more plausible. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that the archaeologists should interpret the data differently to combat pseudoscience. I'm saying the archaeologists should actually, like, look at the damn data when you've got the fourth dynasty dating 150 to 300 years consistently older than the written records i would go out on a limb and say your written records are probably wrong or your interpretation of the dating of those written records is wrong because that carbon dating when it, if it was one or two of these pyramids or temples sure but when it's every damn one of the fourth dynasty ones come on guys but nope 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 this is the kind of stuff that makes it very easy to just say these guys fucking hiding stuff because it kind of looks like they are. Graham uses the teeth, cart tracks, and star alignment theories to jump to the conclusion that there was an ancient civilization traveling the globe teaching all the separate ancient civilizations the secrets of the stars during the Ice Age. No joke. That's where this is all heading. Spoiler alert. Now this is honestly an impressively fair evaluation of his claims because she didn't invoke ancient high tech, which would be very easy to do because almost everybody does it and it's just an assumption that you can think about Hancock. But he doesn't say it in this episode. So Astra and the scientist at Bad Astra didn't break out that argument. Again, there's some integrity here. This channel's highly underrated. He's using these Malta temples, which might align with the Crux or Sirius, to argue that not only does Atlantis exist, but they were the ones who taught our primitive ancestors before being lost to a great flood. Finally, we get to the Atlanteans. This is a concept known as hyperdiffusionism. Basically, it's cultural diffusion turned all the way up to 11. And if someone is engaged in Atlantis hunting, this concept will be part of it. Every single time they're going to be finding connections across the globe that normally you would not find. Normal cultural diffusion would say, you know, on the same continent through trade routes and whatnot, hyperdiffusionism posits global trade routes in times immemorial. And this is always going to show up in Atlantis hunting, so that's important to keep in mind. There are so many questions that need to be asked about this premise. Why couldn't these different indigenous cultures build these monuments on their own? 
Why doesn't Graham think it's possible for these cultures to look up and see the stars themselves? Why does he think these indigenous cultures were more primitive and less able to build these architectural marvels than these mythical Atlanteans? If the Atlanteans could travel the world teaching everyone agriculture, why were they taken out by a flood? Oh boy. All right. First of all, the indigenous people in question here would be the Maltese, which would be Mediterranean European people, not people that would be traditionally considered like oppressed by being indigenous people, right? Um, furthermore, Hancock doesn't really like think that only Atlanteans looked at the stars. He's drawing a connection. He's saying that all of these cultures venerated Sirius. The Maltese and the Egyptians and the people in South America and all these people, they, they looked at Sirius and saw it in the night sky. And of course, Astra and Eris and all of Nova and Apollo, any of you who are watching right now are just screaming, what? Of course, Sirius is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. If you look at the sky, you're going to effing notice Sirius. I agree, but that's his evidence, okay? So, yeah. That's, it's not about indigenous people didn't look at stars. It's all of these people venerated Sirius. Ergo, they must have shared a connection because why else would you look at Sirius? They, they, they all look at stars. He, he, he's very, very much about every culture looking at stars. Now, the movie to Big Rocks is a different thing. Hancock is a proponent of ancient high technology, and I'm not, so we will definitely differ here. But... Um, it's, again, his whole deal is that these people all around the world built pyramids to like for afterlife and shit like that, right? So he has these ideas about things that are not necessarily accurate, but that's his lines of evidence. And it's not about like these people couldn't do it and these people could. It is much more about why are they all sharing the same thing around the globe, no matter how tenuous the shared thing actually is. Also, when you imagine someone from Atlantis, what do they look like? Are they white? Funny how that happens. It's almost as if people have thought Atlanteans were white since the Nazi pseudo-archaeologists claimed that the Aryan race originated from Atlanteans. Looks like we're back to the racist pseudoscience again. Now myself, I never thought that race really mattered. I mean, if you're talking like 12,000 years ago that all this shit got wiped out, then, you know, like 30,000 years ago, you know, race is like geography plus time and, and humans, right? You just take some humans, you put them somewhere else, you give them some time and isolation, and, and they look a little different from based on the freaking environment. So, you know, if you go back 40 or 50,000 years, I don't really think that we would have like the same racial makeups that we would have much today, except for in places like Africa, where it's kind of the, the birthplace of humanity, the people that haven't really left there. But, but Hancock, he's got three places that he thinks that the, the, the Atlanteans could have come from. There are, mm. there are three places in the world which are really lacking in the investigation right now. One of them is the Amazon, five and a half million square kilometers, very little archaeology done. Another is the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert, tough place to work. I can understand why there's little archaeology done there. But the Sahara Desert was green during the Ice Age. It had a completely different climate regime. We should consider the possibility that missing parts of the human story are there. And then under the continental shelves, because sea level rose 400 feet. These are three domains that archaeology has largely not investigated. Now, one of these has a small possibility of white Atlanteans, but the other two are just flat out no. And yes, Nazis have absolutely used this kind of crap in the past. But they also use mainstream regular old archaeology too. Racists are kind of gross that way. You hand them literally anything and they will find a way to twist it into something grotesque and racist. Even a cartoon frog. Unless you were thinking of the Disney Atlanteans, which had darker skin and were probably more historically accurate. Wait, what? Eris... What did I just read? It's Atlantis. You can't say anything about Atlanteans is historically accurate. They are a fictional civilization featured in a Disney movie. This isn't about whether Jesus was white. This is about whether mermaids are... I heard it as I said it. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I, I had to leave that in because, God damn it, that was funny. <laughs> That's so good. Archaeologist Flint Dibble points out how Graham is doing nothing new when it comes to disrupting the paradigm or whatever. He's just repackaging the work of Ignatius Donnelly, who also believed in Atlantis and white supremacy. Donnelly also promoted the theory of Atlanteans teaching indigenous cultures about architecture and civilizing them before a great flood came to wipe out the Atlanteans, who he also claimed were the origins of the Aryan race. <sighs> Big yikes to that! Yeah, Flint and I have actually talked about this at length, and this is where things kind of get frustrating for me. To be honest, I think that scientists like Bad Aster will probably see my frustration. Because while Ignatius Donnelly did in fact heavily promote Atlantis hunting with this grotesque racist twist, it was in fact a twist. He was heavily influenced by the works of Charles Atin Brazier de Bourbourg and Augustus Le Plognon, both of whom believed the Maya, not the Aryans, were the Atlanteans or the inheritors of the Atlantean stuff, the primary race after the wipeout of the great biblical flood. Now this is something that John Hoops and Flint Dibble routinely ignore when they speak on this matter. And the Society for American Archaeology, aka Big Archaeology, wrote a letter to Netflix like requesting a few things in regards to ancient apocalypse. In it, they say... The assertions Hancock makes have a history of promoting dangerous racist thinking. His claim for an advanced global civilization that existed during the Ice Age and was destroyed by a comet is not new. This theory has been presented, debated, and refuted for at least 140 years. It dates to the publication of Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, 1882, and Ragnarok, the Age of Fire and or excuse me, the Age of Ice and Gravel, 1883, by Minnesota Congressman Ignatius Donnelly. Now, when I pressed Flint on this issue and I pointed out, I'm like, hey, man, it doesn't date to Ignatius Donnelly. It dates to Augustus Le Plognon and Charles Atin de Bourbourg, like I pointed out. He's, he says at first, he's like, ah, it's not a big deal. And then it's like, well, you know, I mean, I did say that there's a comet in, in, in the, that's different because Augustus Le Plognon and uh, Charles Atin de Bourbourg, they didn't say anything about a comet. So it's different. Now, in my opinion, this is as inaccurate as saying archaeology dates back to Nazi Germany and their obsession with racism. It's ignoring the true origins of it in order to claim the roots are in racism, so you bypass things like correlation and causation in any sort of real investigation, because why would you dig into it? If we all know that racists created it to do a racism, why look at it with any more of an eye? This is just made to be racist. Chuck it out. That makes sense. So... They don't address the real origins. It's ignoring the true origins in order to claim that the root of hyperdiffusionism is racism. And the common excuse, that's just a cleverly worded way in order to avoid digging into it. And why dig into correlation versus causation, which is something that of course Astra is well aware exists. Uh, obviously, from a modern lens, I would think, okay, they got their correlation and causation mixed up a little. Obviously, Sirius doesn't control the flooding of the Nile. Although, because the Nile's flooding was seasonal and Sirius's reappearance was also seasonal, they appeared to line up. But she won't bother to look into that with hyperdiffusionism because she's been told by archaeologists that it was created by a racist to do racist stuff. Why look into it? Who cares about correlation versus causation if this is a tool created for racism? So when she sits down and talks to EC Croup, she tells him this. Um, recently on this channel, we did a deep dive into a new uh, Netflix series uh, called Ancient Apocalypse, which is all about how Atlantis is real <laughs> because no societies of color could have developed uh, substantial architecture or astronomy. If you look back to the roots of this crazy Atlantis conspiracy theory, you see that it started in white supremacist, specifically Nazi circles, and this presentation on Netflix, which is a very mainstream platform, or the History Channel, uh, a decade ago, which was a very mainstream platform, is spreading these white supremacist ideas 
in like to the general public and watering them down but there is still that undercurrent of well there's no way that a non-white society could have done all of this but the origins aren't racism at least not white supremacy i mean maybe mayan supremacy if you want to go down that road and even wikipedia mentions this wikipedia names donnelly's references but the archaeologists who don't like hancock they don't mention his references so when the scientists at bad Astra did their research and went by the academic book they asked the experts instead of looking at wikipedia they got misled and then they repeat this to another scientist and like some tenured game of telephone this just travels on down the road despite being astrophysicists they seem to have missed the word comet and the big dramatic change that that implied here and they're looking at it and saying that hyper diffusionism started with ignatius donnelly and racism which is not true and let me clarify there are have been and will continue to be racists that get involved in this stuff. They're in every damn sphere on the planet, and Atlantis hunting does offer them some potentially fertile ground. I won't deny it. And those of us who engage in Atlantis hunting need to be aware and vigilant. These bastards are insidious and will recruit us if they can. But the act of Atlantis hunting is not inherently racist, nor is it rooted in racism. Like millions of other things, racists have co-opted it. And the fact that Donnelly's not the originator may not change Bad Astra's take on whether or not Atlantis hunting is rooted in racism or not. They may look into it and decide that Le Pignon and de Borgborg weren't into a influential enough to count, or they may find modern people like Robert Saphir too influential for their liking. But they should have accurate data to make their own conclusions. I'm sure everyone would agree on that, right? And they didn't get accurate data. They went to a scientist and they would have been better off going to Wikipedia. They would have got the full story there. Instead, they had two important names withheld from the pedigree of this idea in order to forge a narrative. So, big archaeology doesn't lie about Atlantis exactly. But they kind of do. <laughs> Not only does Graham repackage this 1882 theory, but he directly cites it in his 1995 book, Fingerprints of the Gods, with this gem of big racist energy. The road system and the sophisticated architecture had been ancient in the time of the Incas, but that both were the work of white auburn haired men. What the actual fuck is this? <laughs> Now look closely at that sentence. According to Donnelly, there was a local tradition that the indigenous people believed that the roads were made by white auburn haired men. Now in the last 20 years or so, the whole white god Cortez was predicted by the Incas thing has been questioned heavily, with the consensus that the Spanish invented it to prop up their colonial government being pretty well accepted at this point. But that is a more recent acceptance. It's not something that was accepted 30 years ago for certain, even 25 years ago. You can find stuff from about 20 years ago where people are saying that it's not still heavily known outside of the Mesoamerican studies. But just like somebody saying there's a local tradition of a giant making these Maltese temples, or someone saying Hadrian's Wall wasn't built by the locals, the idea that some people were there who weren't the indigenous people is not racist. And Flint does this shit all the time, actually, and it is hilarious. He'll he'll be like, oh, there was, oh, Hancock said there was a white dude over in Japan at one point. And he's like, well, so? <laughs> well, uh, that's racist. <laughs> okay, think about this. There was a time when it was believed that Columbus was the first European to have discovered the Americas, right? So anybody here before Columbus would have been considered racist if you found evidence for that? Like, say, the Norse, for example? So was that guy a racist? Well, he probably was because he was alive back then. But was that guy a racist because he was positing that the Norse came? To no. Okay. There's a huge distinction between saying these people could not have ever done this without some help from white people and saying these people had a white guy visit. Uh, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you an example here because where Donnelly does get just grotesquely racist is one of his lines of reasoning, one of his lines of evidence is, oh, you know, well, this myth, it didn't evolve for a long time. So it must have never been in white people's hands because white people, they innovate things. But indigenous people, every other culture, they don't do any of that innovation. Okay, that is the kind of shit that they should be talking about 
but they can't because Hancock doesn't go down that road and they're trying to pin Donnelly's shit on Hancock. Ancient Aliens, Atlantis Reborn, and now Ancient Apocalypse are not big archaeology keeping the truth from us. It's an insidious plot to make white supremacist conspiracy theories consumable to a general audience. Now this is Horseshoe Theory Incarnate. On the one hand, we have Pyramidians taking erroneous data and forging a conspiracy theory where there's an insidious group of people out to misinform the public. And on the other hand, we have a group of scientists taking erroneous data and forging a conspiracy theory where there's an insidious group of people out to misinform the public. This is why I've spoken out so strongly against the SAA letter to the point where Flint and Bill and JT and myself had a bit of a falling out and I don't really know what to say about that. It sucks, but it is what it is. So many archaeologists hit this shit with a broad brush and it's, it's, it's crap. I'll take this a step further and get into my own personal history because this sort of stuff happened to me too and it is applicable here. I don't really want to talk about this, but here we go. In 2009, my youngest kid's mom and I split up. In 2015, she went into hiding, keeping my son out of school, denying me and him time together. For seven months, he was missing. Over 200 days, I woke up and not knowing where he was, but I did know that she hurt him physically. That was a big sticking point with this, but I was having a hard time proving it. I was able to later to prove it in court. I tried everything I could do to find him, and eventually I did, and I now have custody of him. Now, there was little question about who was the better parent after his mom went off the rails, but before that, she was assumed to be the better parent, with me being forced to take parenting classes before being considered a primary caretaker and her not. Now, one of the things that I did was try to get the word out on social media, please help me find my son, and that sort of thing. I ended up attracting the attention of father's rights groups, and with them came the men's rights groups. For those of you with a good memory of those days, you'll know how nuts the culture war was back then. Some hashtag about video games and sexism or something had basically both sides at like a fever pitch of screaming and yelling everywhere on the internet. Now the recruiters for these movements, they knew how to play the game. Their rhetoric was spot on. I had always considered myself pro-women's rights, a feminist, and saw the sexism that I was facing as the flip side of sexism women experience. But the MRAs, they knew what to say. The National Organization for Women fights shared custody laws. Bullshit was my response, but after some digging, it turns out that it, this is true to a degree. At least it was back then. The evidence is out there, but it's so hard to find. It's hidden. So I mentioned this to the feminists on Twitter, and I was blasted to holy hell. Called all the phobes, accused of being violent, accused of lying. No one in that community would accept my frustration as it was. The gamer hashtag really had everybody all suspicious of everything, and so... It felt like everywhere I turned, I just got screamed at in that community. I felt betrayed and felt like I'd seen the world with new eyes. Red pilled is what they say for a reason, right? Now, I was a psych major in college, and before I quit like a big loser, psychology was like, I got good grades in psychology. Psychology is something that I'm really into, and I've, I've always taken a degree of pride in being like... I, I, I see propaganda, I see mental manipulation, I see polarization, and I've always been good at avoiding that shit, always been middle of the road, even in my 20s I was that way. But my raw feelings about my son's safety, coupled with the feeling that the world had lied to me, blinded me to what I knew to be true and made me susceptible to that propaganda. Now the nuance that I'm showing you in this video, this isn't new, I've always been like this, but for a few years there, I was pretty much all or nothing, and even when I did make arguments that weren't all or nothing, I was a spicy boy and just didn't give a shit. Now it took a number of things, including me getting custody of my kid, and me looking a lot of my posts with clearer eyes to roll it back, to see where I was, and I started like deleting stuff that I'd put out there and then I started pointing out the errors of like being all polarized to other people in the community and, and that was just basically ignored so I left. I didn't like the arguments that I'd made. Most of the people I was in the community with and I was there because of my experience in family court. And seeing how polarized I'd become made me ashamed. I went from like being somebody who looked at all the different stuff to being like a one per one issue voter. I cared about one thing and I was willing to accept all kinds of bullshit over this one thing. I went from trying to stop the bad things I had experienced to not caring what others experienced. I don't even like to talk about these days anymore. They're embarrassing and really, to be honest, they're painful. Those 200 plus days of my son missing were, were really, really bad. 
So the point is the hidden evidence coupled with the savvy manipulation of the people who wanted to recruit me made for a perfect setup. They could tell me to go talk to the people on Twitter. They knew how it would play out. They could anticipate it. And you can bet your ass they didn't talk to me like they, those other people did. These guys were understanding. They were there for me, man. They, we got your back, bro. They poured gas on my emotional pain, told me it was unfortunate but typical, and I need to lock arms with them if I wanted it to change. Now, obviously, the other people are not going to help, right? They just dismissed me. They, they think that you're just a piece of crap. They called you all the phobes. Now, it worked. I had personal agency, of course, but it's like asking a question for a poll with two different ways and you get two different results. They played the psychology involved. You give those recruiters a few things, someone with an idea they get shit on for expressing, coupled with a lie or other wrong hidden in plain sight by an authoritative body, and some people on the other side who will react with consistent accusations of bigotry, and they can gain recruits easily. Because when that person asks questions or says something that is getting one group of people to just scream bigotry at them but they didn't say anything bigoted it's guilt by association and this other group says hey man we don't think that that's a bigoted thing to say come hang out with us and say the n-word or some shit they managed to get their recruits this way it fucking works man you have been red-pilled the old authority is shit. The new authority is you and your loose group of friends who really know better. And this kind of thinking can apply to the pyramids as well. If a person says, I wonder how they move such big rocks, they will get mockery. Add accusations of racism to the mix, and now you've insulted them, and they're just not going to listen to you. And if you come up to them and say something, hey man, this guy over here, he really is racist. Well, it's too late. You've already cried wolf. You've inoculated them to this stuff. You can no longer point out racism to them. And if you're part of a larger group, which, Jesus Christ, everybody seems to be part of a larger group nowadays, they won't listen to you. And so this is kind of an important thing. It's like you... There's a reason that the ADL doesn't have Atlantis in their stuff. We'll talk about that down the road. But my opinion is that the reason they're not doing it is because they don't want people crying wolf. It consistently undermines the brilliance of indigenous populations who built some of the greatest wonders of the world without white people or aliens. Ironic, given the intro of this episode complaining about straw man historians and archaeologists underestimating the achievements of prior civilizations. Now, this is a great example of the broad brush technique. First of all, this is Malta again. These are white people. Second of all, the indigenous people th that are supposedly influenced by the Egyptians from Africa, right? So this whole thing is like falling apart with just like rudimentary amounts of scrutiny. Um, the guys like Saphir, obviously, notwithstanding. Now the idea the ancients couldn't work stone as well as they did, it's, this is applied to the Greeks as well as all these other cultures. And assertions of guys like Ben, when they talk about this vase, like being precision, it doesn't matter where it was made. He's saying it was made with modern machinery type of stuff. It doesn't matter that it's from Egypt or if it was from Mars. He, he's saying who had modern machinery back in those days. All right. Or like Augustus Le Pognon, the guy I mentioned a little bit ago, who was one of Donnelly's influences. He's the guy who discovered this chalk mule statue. And its similarities to Egyptian iconography is what made him sold on the idea of Mayan culture and Egyptian culture being connected. It was about far-flung trade routes or something, right? It, it, it blew hyperdiffusionism. He went so far as to say that the Mayans conquered the uh, Indians, the India Indians, and um, the other guy, uh, Charles Atin de Borgborg, he, went, he said that he literally says he laughs at the idea of the Aryans being first. So, I mean, these guys were definitely very much removed from that whole thing, but, but there have been a handful of shitty racists throughout history using this stuff as an argument. And they were especially prevalent in the 19th century, back when the world was really racist. Donnelly was an abolitionist, and he was still a raging racist. And Don't even get me started on what archaeology was doing back then. In episode 3, there are three experts referenced. One is Katja Stroud, a curator for Heritage Malta. She is the only credible expert, and she simply introduces the temples, probably without knowledge that her interview was being used to promote pseudoscience. Yeah, she was certainly duped into this, something she's mentioned numerous times in public, and as I've said a few times now, Hancock is going to get diminishing returns by doing this kind of crap, by roping him into it. He can His next special won't have very many archaeologists. 
The others are Lenny Rijic, who is the translator previously mentioned and is an author on a book regarding the serious conspiracy theory, despite having no archaeological or astronomical training. <coughs> Charlatan, <coughs> plagiarist, <coughs> con artist. <coughs> and Dr. Anton Misfit, who isn't an archaeologist, but a pediatrician. Possibly the first time where being an MD rather than a PhD actually gave someone less credibility. Yeah, he does have less credibility in this field, but he is the guy that paid to have the teeth carbon dated. I mean, the Edgar Casey Foundation paid to have the first big run at Giza's carbon dating done. I, you know, so sometimes pseudoscience and, and real science kind of hold hands, especially when the pseudoscientists have deep pockets. Our host, Graham Hancock, is a journalist with no background in archaeology and no peer-reviewed studies. But he is a frequent contributor to the Joe Rogan podcast, known for its fact-checking and rigorous guest standards. Graham has also done a TED Talk on his DMT use, but the TED Science Board had to move it exclusively to their website off of YouTube to properly contextualize it to highlight both Hancock's provocative ideas and the factual problems with his arguments. He's not known for having the facts. He's simply another useful idiot. And I say that in the political sense, not as a personal attack. Well, maybe a little as a personal attack. Yeah, he likes Joe Rogan, DMT, and is clearly a pseudoscientist. But a useful idiot in a political sense? No, 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 no. Not even close. I'm assuming this is about the white supremacy thing again. And did you know that the ADL, like I said, doesn't even like list the mention of Atlantis in any of their papers? Not one time. They go after Stormfront. They go after the Proud Boys. They go after some whatever. They never once bring up Atlantis. And like I said, I'm pretty sure that the reason is, is because they recognize this is like extraneous. It's the kind of thing that doesn't make racist. It's the kind of thing that racists grab onto and you're like, reason 433 is that white people are great. But it's not the kind of thing that like takes somebody and makes them, oh man, Atlantis was ran by Aryans? Well, fuck me. Hell with that dude next door. Atlantis. That, that's not how this goes down, right? Okay. And the ADL's well aware, well aware of that. But <laughs> archaeologists would really like it to be different because then they would have a real lever they could pull in society when they were like trying to get people to help them fight against this pseudoscience because most people don't really give a shit if you lie about the pyramids because there's like a thousand people out there lying about the pyramids or saying things that are wrong about the pyramids. That don't matter. But if you say that they're propping up racism, well, <laughs> people care then, right? By the way, the ADL does have a page for Pepe the Frog, so clearly they don't think that, that, that this is nearly as big of a problem as archaeologists do. And I would point out that when an archaeologist is stepping from history and archaeology and into the realm of psychology and into social stuff, they're, they're, they're getting outside of their, of their like field a tiny bit. You know, anthropology can weigh into it to a degree, but that's not really the study of the causation versus correlation part of this thing is, is basically what it would come down to, right? Does Atlantis hunting create racists? And that's something you need some, uh, you know, science to weigh in on. And until we have that, I dare say that any accusations otherwise without a direct correlation versus causation effect it would be pseudoscience. People believe this nonsense because they want to feel smart. Academia has a history of being elitist, inaccessible, and discriminatory. Now the notion that we do this just to feel smart is pretty elitist, I'm sorry. Uh, the evidence is what compels us to start and then some of us go down the rabbit hole. Like I said earlier about the 20 year construction timeline on the pyramid, there are things that get people started on that path that science is doing. And one of, this, if one of these things is the squareness of the pyramid. It is so accurate that it's about two inches off at worst on a 756 foot run. That's like a one five thousandth of a margin of error. At 750 feet, rope will sag dramatically. You're not measuring this with rope or scaled up means like the two, three, four because repeated measurements are like you take a rod and repeatedly measure. Every time you do that, you're going to add a little error to it. And again, like a one in a five thousandth margin of error. I'm not a proponent of ancient high technology, okay? 
So I'm looking at things like a concave mirror. Do they use a concave mirror and a target maybe and, and like figure out how big the circle of light would be at a certain distance? That, that's the best that I could come up with as a layman trying to figure this out. As a layman who works construction and knows that 760 foot run, you're not, that's shit they use transits for nowadays for a reason because they weren't, they, even the gothic shit ain't that square, man. And they were good in the gothic days and it ain't close to that square. It's th some not magic, not high technology, but there's something there that we haven't quite grasped yet that they used. That's cool to me, and that's a mystery, but that's discarded and glossed over by archaeology because, and I'm certain that a lot of it's because of like, you know, two sides fighting over all this crap, so you can't give them an inch, they'll take a mile kind of bullshit. But the reality of it is, is, is by disregarding this, it there's only one place to go to talk about the mystery. Like I was saying earlier with my own experience with, with my kid, there's only one place to go to talk about it. You funnel them into there. And then if you also funnel racists over there, well then what have you done? So when scientists come off as condescending assholes, it makes sense that people want to prove them wrong. And Graham takes full advantage of this effect by using the introduction of this episode to paint archeologists and historians as close-minded and patronizing, casting himself as the underdog so the audience will root for him and his wild theories. But the way to effectively prove scientific consensus wrong isn't to interview pediatricians about archeology span or share unvetted memes on Facebook. It's to perform science that's peer-reviewed. Read articles from nonpartisan sources that have gone through rigorous review processes. Or, if you don't like reading, just watch our videos and those by other science communicators who aren't making claims about scientists lying to you or big archaeology keeping results secret. Now Hancock does play that to the hilt and it works. And I'll be honest, it's good to see Bad Astra take some responsibility here, uh, lay it at the feet of science. It's not for hiding the truth of Atlantis, but for coming off as arrogant and condescending and thereby playing into Hancock's hands, like I was talking about earlier. And notice that Astra said non-partisan sources. Now, I know she's got political opinions. I, I, I've looked around a little bit and seen, they, they every now and again they say something, you can smell it in this video. But she's telling you, you can't trust partisan sources. This is integrity right there. Again, like I said, you need to get your ass over there, click the little bell thing. Mine too, of course, if you haven't clicked my stuff, but you need to go over there and take care of the people over at Bad Astra too, because those scientists, they need encouraged to make them all videos because we don't see enough of this in the discourse here and encouraging them to contribute would be a good thing. More nuanced discussion, hopefully. I do hope the scientists at Bad Astra at least look into the claims made by Dibble, Hoops, and other archaeologists regarding the origins of Atlantis hunting and white supremacy. I personally feel this label is more harmful than not and serves only to polarize the discourse. Even if they feel Atlantis hunting is still problematic, I will hope they'll recognize the problem with scientists spreading half-truths and disinformation. Again, Wikipedia would have been a better source than the archaeologist that they cited. He withheld information that freaking Wikipedia had. What kind of a world do we live in when you can't go to a, a scientist for information and get it as good as you do from Wikipedia? This is a problem. Okay, well, I could complain about this forever, but I, I should probably stop. So I want to thank my patrons especially. Thank you so much. I thank all of you, my regular viewers. Thank the astronauts and Bad Astra and um, for putting out good content. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you guys next time. I hope you don't think I'm a horrible person for um, having a few years of uh, stupidity there. Um, you know, it is what it is. But uh, anyway, we'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs> so before we dive into that, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about archaeoastronomy, what it is, and why it's relevant in modern times? Uh, fair enough, and and it's not surprising anyone would be a, a little puzzled. Archaeoastronomy, first and foremost, is a word with far too many vowels, and it was <laughs> in fact coined in the 70s, the 1970s, when a, a handful of people started getting very interested uh, cross-culturally in the uh, expressions of astronomy in primarily ancient monuments.